Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Let's get into it. Thank you very much, uh, Christine Coronado from Labjack Corporation in the United States of America. I'm sure we've had Labjack before, right? Oh, well, spoiler alert. <laughs> there you go. I have no idea what it kind of is, though. I'm sure we've had Labjack on here before. Anyway, they're from Lakewood, Colorado. I don't want my viewers in Lakewood, Colorado. There's a few in Colorado. Had a few mailbags from Colorado. Let's have a look. We have a note. Labjack. Hi, Dave. Big fan of your show since uh, going to college and watching your Fundamentals Fridays. I've been working as an engineer at Labjack for 10 years now. <laughs> been watching since the beginning, have you? It's almost 10 years in April. I think April 4th is the official EEV blog anniversary. Anyway, finally been able to convince some of my co-workers that it would be a good idea to send you one about. I'm sure Labjack have sent something in before. I could have sworn. Anyway, got obligatory stickers and a stationary bottle opener. What is a stationary bottle opener? Oh, I get it why it's called a stationary bottle opener because it come with, comes with screws and you... I'm standing on bubble wrap. <laughs> and you just screw it into a wall and then you... Oh! Glass, very nice, thank you very much. <laughs> Tool holder. Because <laughs> I don't... I assume that looks like a beer glass, right? I don't drink beer, but... Oh, got a t-shirt. Thank you very much, Labjack. Check it out. By the way, medium or small, none of this large rubbish if you are going to send in a shirt. Especially none of those la American large, which is like... <laughs> it's practically a dress here in Australia. Anyway, um, so what do we got? Labjack T7 Pro. I have no idea what a T7 Pro is. Got one of the uh, ever useful uh, uh, the screwdrivery pocket things that go in your pocket. Cool. This looks like some sort of... That looks like a PLC kind of thing. So, so let's check it out. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You don't see the big ass D connectors like that anymore. Old school. Ah, oh, and they sent the correct USB. None of this Yankee rubbish. They sent an Aussie one. Unfortunately, it's not compliant. Check it out. It does not have the insulation on the pins. That is technical, technically. Illegal here in Australia. Don't know how it got cut past customs. Whoa. Anyway, she'll be right. So what we've got here is an industrial DAC device or data acquisition device and it contains DACs and ADCs and all sorts of uh, stuff. It's just like you'd get like the National Instruments uh, cards or classic uh, DAC cards, for example. This one is not only uh, USB, Ethernet, but it's got uh, Wi-Fi as well, obviously. So it's a Wi-Fi -y. Um, a DAC thing, 429 Yankee bucks, which might sound expensive, but for a professional uh, data acquisition device, it's peanuts, really. And it looks quite the part. I like it. And here's some more detail on that. I can leave you to uh, read it, but it's got a mod bus, so that can be integrated with larger SCADA systems and things like that. So it's great for uh, load cells, RTDs, thermocouples, and all the business. And if we have a look at some of the specs here, it's pretty impressive. 14 analog inputs, 16 to 24 bits, depending on speed and device type. Excellent. Expand to 84 analog inputs when you actually mux them all together. 16-bit uh, ADC, up to 100K samples per second. Or the Pro is actually 24-bit low ADC, as low as one microvolt no noise-free. They're, they're, what they're talking about when they talk about noise free is the uh, least significant, there's no noise on the least significant bit or last couple of least significant bits, I guess. But geez, that's an ask. Um, software configurable resolution, single ended or differential input. Fantastic, because sometimes you need differential. Analog input ranges, handy, plus minus 10 and 1 and 0.1 and 10 millivolt ranges as well. Wow, killer. Low latency, sampling and control, less than one millisecond, beautiful. It seems to have all the business, 12-bit uh, DACs as well. It's really quite a professional uh, feature set for a DAC system. Yeah, terrific. High-speed counters and uh, quadrature inputs and uh, like PWM outputs. Wow, it's got everything. Fixed current outputs as well. 200 microamps, 10 microamps. Wow. Take a squeeze inside, I'll just get the Wi-Fi antenna out of the way, and there we go. 
That looks pretty jazzy. There's a lot involved in there. PIC32 processor. Let's have a look on the bottom. Got real-time clock, of course, that hence the battery. Uh, this is Rev 1.35. Jeez, it's been through a few revisions, of course, which you'd expect. Looks like that some sort of protection job in there, perhaps, right near the input. But uh, yeah, yeah, on these sorts of things, protection's a big uh, deal as well. Looks like they're uh, like got lots of serious resistors in there. Looks like they're doing the business. So yeah, PIC32 processor upside down, so all the electrons are going to fall out. Then we've got our Wi-Fi module. I don't think I recognise that particular one. Anyway, that's likely our programming header for our uh, PIC32 micro. For those who want to see exactly what model that one is, there you go. I won't go through in detail and read all the uh, part numbers or whatnot. Oh, we got a. Oh, did that go to the outside? A little micro SD card there? Probably. Can we update the uh, firmware? Has it got a remote bootloader? Anyway, it looks like there's lots of ADC and DAC stuff happening around there. I won't go into a huge amount of detail trying to get these parts, but you can have a look. AD7190 there. And. Yeah, the other ones, you can't decode them properly. Bit of a pain in the butt. DG series, that'd be a uh, MUX switch thingamabob. Another couple of DG series MUXs, stuff like that. Looks like you've got all your requisite, uh, some diode protection on the input. Clamping, here's our pick. More clamping, more clamping, more clamping. Ethernet chipset. Wow, that's a tidy little array, isn't it? What are they doing there? And double-sided load, because they really couldn't fit everything on the one side. It would have made it uh, significantly larger. All sorts of fused inputs. So I'm sure they've got all the requisite protection on this thing. No worries. Don't you hate lead-free solder and how they look like Frosty the Snowman there? But there's nothing wrong with those joints. It's just, it's just lead-free solder. <laughs> So the hardware looks quite nice, and I'm sure a lot of work and uh, revision has uh, refinement, spit and polish has uh, gone into getting that down. It's in a uh, nice form factor, but uh, it's for this sort of thing, it's all about the software. So let's just fire it up and uh, see what's what. And you get a calibration certificate. Beautiful. Like, you've got to specify your temperature to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Two decimal places, no worries. And uh, yeah, they use some uh, HP uh, Benchtop DMM and, uh, and a calibrator. That's like great. That should keep the uh, QA department happy. All right, so let's install the software for this thing, which I already actually have. I've uh, just downloaded, installed the software, downloaded that, no problems. I connected it, it connected up, no problems whatsoever. We got the LEDs on there and then we run this Kipling thing. By the way, it uses the National Instruments uh, drivers and whatnot. And then we run this Kipling thing, and there we go. Scan, USB, Ethernet, Wi-Fi. I'm not going to bother hooking up to Wi-Fi at the moment. I'm sure, I'm sure it works, but there we go. It found it. Just bam, straight off the bat. So let's go run the uh, application software. And there's a log, and there's a stream. So, oi, here it is. Hang on. Okay, I just had to type in a file name, and there it is, and we're logging. Wow, look at that. There was initial uh, amplitude, <laughs> right, so they're right down at, it must be in bipolar mode, because it, uh, and number of channels, can we just go up? We can just increase our number of channels, yep. Terrific, why are we choosing four? There we go, I can just turn them off and on. That's great. I've got no signals fed in at the moment, so, you know, I <laughs> I have no doubt it works. Um, it's sampling interval. So can you go down to like one millisecond or something like that? Yep, number of iterations. There it goes. Fanta graph history, change working directory, all that sort of stuff. You can write to file. You can just go, can we just, yep. Because I put in a file name before, it asks you that when you load up. And I'm sure it's, is that, I guess it's automatically saving that, is it? Huh. And anyway, most of those analog inputs would be on the uh, D connectors, of course. I haven't looked at the pinouts or anything like that. You've got your other stuff here, like your current outputs and things like that. So anyway, can we like zoom in? How do we zoom in? We can't zoom in. This is very... Ah, oh, see? Yeah, this is like it's written in lab view or whatever, or lab windows CVI. I, I used to write in lab windows CVI. I've done lots of uh, automation 
uh, lots of production test system auto automation in Lab Windows uh, CVI, and it's like it's giving you the screen, like like <laughs> just the big window pane. That's a bit. Come on, we need to fix that. I'm sure there's a way to fix that. That's a bit amateur hour. So yeah, this is all standard like Lab View type windows and grass, but we can't seem to resize that, and I can't I can't zoom or pan or do. Oh, here we go. Okay, right click. And auto scale X, auto scale Y. It's not really auto scaling, is it? If it it should be like uh, down, it should be should zoom in. Oh, because we're not on the right range. How do we change our range? Scaling equations. You can put the equations in. That's nice. But I don't see a place to set up. Not in here anyway. To set up your analog inputs to change your range and stuff like that. It's purely just a login program. Okay. There's this other thing called stream, and it's going really slowly maybe because I'm sampling over here perhaps once a second or something like that it'll come good no see it's really jerky I can't have both of these running at the same time wow that's a bit clunky I can't even oh I've got it see you can't even shut down the window you've got to use the exit over here this is like real old school lab view <laughs> lab view stuff and you can start stream so i'm not sure what the difference between log and stream is it's popped up yes this program worked correctly i guess <laughs> scan log scan reads millisecond per loop scan reads so it's streaming to a file so i i don't quite understand i did i'd have to rtfm Sorry, this is not going to be an in-depth review i just want to see that it talks and and it's sampling stuff and it's just floating which is what you'd expect. Start stream. There we go. So it's doing that, but it's not. Oh, okay. That's why our auto scale didn't work before, because we had the. I still can't change manually change the the axes down here. That's a bit disappointing. And I can't like just do basic stuff like zoom in. Uh -huh. Now you've got to understand that these are just like um, example apps and stuff like that. The whole point about these sort of things is that you integrate them into your own production test system. So you write your own software. That's why you would use like the LabView interface. I don't know if they have a Lab Windows CVI. They do have a C uh, interface as well. I'm, uh, yes, C, C++. Um, and it's not native lab view support. You've got to use their library, so the LJM library there, but who cares, right? That's what you'd expect because it's not National Instruments uh, approved hardware. Uh, like you don't use the supplied software, so it's just examples. Not sure if they supply the source code for the uh, supplied examples or not. It's, you know, the hardware is professional and I'm sure the drivers uh, work just fine and I'm sure they'd provide professional level support as well if you get into trouble actually, uh, you know, trying to implement this in your own test system. I have no doubt about it. So the dashboard. Well, let's go back to Kipling. I think that's where we set it up. Here we go. There we go. We're in like Flynn and device info. Here we go. This is so this Kipling side isn't this nice. Oh, and they've got the direct links to all the example code for C, C++, LabVIEW, Python, DAC Factory, Java, .NET, Node.js, and more. Okay. Yep. I'm I'm thoroughly impressed. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah, this it's a professional level support for this thing, as I said, as you'd expect. SD card installs high high res ADC installed real time clock. Wow. Yeah, there, here's the, this is the dashboard for it. Oh, look at that. It's got the pinouts and everything, and you can just select, oh, oh, very nice. Yep, that's absolutely terrific. DB30, like nobody uses DB37s anymore. That's hilarious, and DB15s. <laughs> it's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Old school stuff. Um, and, and the analog input you can configure. There you go. Here's where you can configure your ranges. And I'm sure that flows through to the other uh, software and stuff like that. Register matrix. Whoa. Wow. Wow. This is... Oh. Wow. Okay. This is incredibly powerful. Wow. Filter by tags. Analog input. <laughs> If you want just the UART stuff, there it is. You can define all the UART registers settings. Lua script debugger. I, I'm not into Lua, but yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> power up defaults, device updater, DAC outputs. Well, we've only got the two 12-bit DAC. Anyway, I'm thoroughly impressed. That is 
Anyway, that's enough for a mailbag. Uh, thank you very much, Labjack, for sending in. Might be able to use that on like automation test projects. Shame it doesn't have the uh, like motor driver, like a couple of motor driver channels in it. That would have been uh, it's asking to. It's a data acquisition system. It's asking too much. But like, a, I just need needed something like this would have been perfect for getting the toggle bot back up and running because we've got a new version of the meter with we just want to test the switches again the 121 GW meter and uh, yeah if it had a, just a couple of uh, motor driver channels we could have uh, used this for the toggle bot would have been fantastic but yeah I'm I am pretty impressed by this so far the but these supplied applications typical they leave a bit to be desired they're just like slap together lab view stuff but in terms but as i said you, you're generally not going to be using those you're going to integrate this into a production test system and for that it looks like a winner for your 430 bucks or whatever it was so that's that's pretty good thanks labjack that's awesome hi to all my viewers in italy this one comes from bellina limited or whatever it's got bellina fin on there I don't know. Let's go. Let's go. Is that shipping label here. Cool looking large demo y board. Sort of, yeah, it's a Raspberry Pi type board. We have a note. Hi, Dave. Please find enclosed an early production unit of our carrier board for the Raspberry Pi compute module. We found a lot of people are looking to deploy Raspberry Pi in commercial and industrial environments at scale, and so we've worked hard to create a board which solves the issues faced. Because you might ask, why not just use a Raspberry Pi instead of putting a Raspberry Pi compute module onto a board which then becomes a Raspberry Pi board? <laughs> this is the reason why. Uh, wider power ranges, wider temperature ranges, more robust physical connectors, power over Ethernet, etc., etc., while still running all the software that the Pi does. We added some stuff too, namely a coprocessor. What sort of coprocessor would they have on it? And does the Raspberry Pi ecosystem support a coprocessor? Like software ecosystem support a coprocessor? I have no idea. Real-time clock? Yeah, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have a real-time clock, does it? Um, and a uh, mini PCI slot and dual camera support, because if you want to do like stereo vision stuff, the regular Raspberry Pi only supports one. So, cool. Let's take a look. Thank you very much, uh, Chris Crocker White, hyphenated last name. Ooh, go to the other bench. So yes, just a reminder, if you are going to send stuff in, make sure you put mailbag on the top. Otherwise, I could accidentally open it thinking it's something I've ordered. We get the uh, Bellina fin, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, board. We'll take a close look at that. Get a funky looking case. It's all plastic. I like how that's got a rubber baby buggy bumper on there. That's your DC input jack. And uh, looks like that just... Whoop splits apart that's just a plastic case does have a vent hole there but like there's no fan or anything like that to uh keep it going not sure of the power dissipation of this um so you can probably whack a heat sink on that maybe and uh if you well i don't know is there enough room at the bottom yeah there probably is enough room at the bottom to actually have the heat sink on there i suspect and you get a plug pack with all the requisite uh, adapters it's just one of those things that plugs on let's take a close look at the board so it's got the Raspberry Pi uh, hat on it, of course. Nicely color-coded. Look at that. Not sure how they've actually uh, done that, but that's pretty neat. I like it. Um, a surface mount fuse over here. Very nice. Got another one over here. Look at the DC input. You can power it from a DC jack or a uh, Phoenix-type connector, Molex-type connector. And uh, look, massive diode protection here. Surface mount fuse in a holder. Fantastic. More protection, more protection. And that's just absolutely terrific, what you want for an industrial solution. Um, expansion, I'm not sure what type of expansion header that is. And it's got the requisite uh, Ethernet to USB. Probably would have been nicer to have more USBs on there. Like two's, you know, a bit limiting. Um, I'm not doesn't seem to have power over the Ethernet. Um, let me check that. No, sure enough, um, you've got to put on the power over Ethernet hat. So you've got to actually, um, yeah, d like waste a hat for to get power over Ethernet functionality. Oh, would have been really nice if that was built in. Um, anyway, like not everyone's going to use it, so it does waste uh, space and cost and all the rest of it. But still, that would have been nice. Got ourselves our antenna down there, all the ground planes pulled back. Very nice. 
And there's our co-processor. It's actually a Silicon Labs uh, BGM triple one. As I said, I'm not sure how that works inside the uh, ecosystem, but of course you could. It's got its own uh, Wi-Fi thing, so you could uh, like just run your own like little Wi-Fi apps in there. So uh, uh, Wi-Fi related apps. So that's you know really what they mean uh, by that co-processor i think it's not like a you know you can offload uh all of your like you know your heavy math or anything to this sort of thing it's like that's not what it's for it's designed for like um application control and stuff like that so you can run your own little application on there which runs entirely separate to the raspberry pi so that's pretty neat so camera zero there and camera one and also uh display as well and of course as you'd expect HDMI and a mini uh, PCI Express slot. That's very nice. So you can put some uh, nice storage solutions on there or whatnot. And uh, that's where we plug in our Raspberry Pi. Let's whack that in there. Made in the old Dart. Fantastic. So we're in like Flynn. Let's power it up. So I power it from the DC jack, 6 to 30 volts input. That's a nice range. I like it. We get a 12 volt, 1.5 amp pack with it. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. First hurdle is I got a, just pulled a uh, configured SD, micro SD card out of another Raspberry Pi. Random one I had lying around and went to plug it in and it doesn't go in because that's a nano SIM connector and there is nowhere else to plug it in wah, 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 wah. but then i realized it does have a built-in uh, emmc memory that's the sandisk chip down in there but still i reckon that's a huge oversight not to have i'm sure, not sure why they deliberately decided not to have a micro sd card that's like you can just whip it out of or compatible with any other raspberry pi it just they've got they've added everything including the kitchen sink except micro sd card well well i'll tell you what for the 199 yankee bucks that this uh thing costs uh, by the way it's a complete kit it does come with the raspberry pi compute module the case and everything else so um yeah it did want to come already pre-configured and fired up let's hope so let's plug in a monitor Nope, turns out doesn't look like it comes pre-configured. I just get zippity doo -dah. But the thing is the eMMC memory on here with the uh, this little micro USB here, apparently if you plug in the micro USB, it automatically enters a boot programming mode where it turns it into a mass storage device. So uh, yeah, at least we can get access to it. But still, I think it's just a silly decision not to have a micro SD card on there. So you can just come along and just upgrade the firmware with just a like SD card. That's all upgrade the firmware, the OS, you know, with the, it's not one of these uh, newfangled embedded things. This is like a, yeah, full on PC, whatever. Anyway, I, I think that's a big oversight. It's nice to have the eMMC memory on there. That's, don't get me wrong, that's nice. But yeah, it's, uh, micro SD card, please. All right, so I'm going to plug this up. Um, I don't. I you might be able to power it through the micro USB, but I think it's really just designed for, especially not with all the extra stuff on there. Um, you know, if you want to take any grunty stuff from it, you should power it from the DC jacks. Anyway, it will have enough power to boot this thing up and get it running as a mass storage device. It's supposed to auto boot into a mass storage device. I'm not seeing any bloop bloop thing on Windows. Uh, I'll get back to you. So here's the page, by the way. Go in and order it now. Flexible networking, real-time, low-power, capable, excellent embedded 32-bit uh, ARM. That's the uh, co-processor. Allows maximum power efficiency in real-time computing. Expandable, blah, 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 blah. Why, Belina Finn. There you go. You can go check it all out. And uh, it is very feature-packed. But yeah, as I said, I've, um, it looks pretty comprehensive. There's a big manual for it. And yes, um, the schematics are available. Check them out. You can just download those from the GitHubs. Here is our data sheet, and we'll go in there and we'll try and figure out how to, because this thing ain't popping up. So got to go in there and figure out how to get this mass storage working. So then I can download the, uh, like a Raspbian uh, image and put it on the thing so it can boot up. It should come pre-configured for 199 buck pack i want it out of the box i want it to just work with you know raspian or whatever
please. And next, open the EMC flashing tool such as Et Etcher. What the hell is Etcher? To instruct the fin to boot into USB mass storage mode. No, out of the box. For, I don't want to jump through these stupid hoops. I don't care how easy. Like, everyone knows, oh, yeah, I use Etcher all the time. Yeah, whoop de doo No, this is ridiculous. It should either come pre-configured and work out of the box or have that micro SD card. Well, at least they don't buggy you off to some github -y, stupid GitHub thing somewhere. At least, um, yeah, select image, yeah, download 64, all right. All right, there we go, I've got to select the image, so I've got to go find a Raspbian image or whatever, and then select it, and we should be able to flash it. Oh, I just remembered that you need to have an imaging tool for a micro SD card for <laughs> Raspberry Pi anyway, so okay, you know, it, fair enough. Still, I reckon it should have a micro SD card so that you can just mass produce these things or whatever, especially if you've got an array of them or something like that. You know, you just want to be able to swap it in and out. Only 12 hours left. <sighs> Thankfully, the torrent's going to be a bit quicker. There you go, 9.1 megabytes per second. Sweet. All right, we select the full image. That was quick. That only took a couple of minutes. And select drive. No removable drive detected. Wah, 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 wah. Well, sorry, I'd love to show you this working, but I can't get it to work. I, I'm following the instructions. It's like not rocket science. It's like plug it in. It says that uh, and instruct the fin to boot into USB mass storage mode. I don't know how to do that. I just load the program and I run the etcher program and it doesn't give me like any option to enable it into boot mode. I thought it like did it automatically. It's just... I, I'm trying different USB ports and I simply cannot get this damn thing to boot into a drive. So that's actually running sweet now and apparently there's like a Ballina OS. There's an operating system using Docker containers. Yeah, I got no idea there's a command line interface. All you geeks can just go absolutely crazy and they've got like a GitHub with all the uh, Ballina Fin like cloud, Ballina cloud examples and all sorts of stuff. So it looks like it's pretty comprehensive. It's not just a Raspberry Pi industrial computer. It looks like they've got all their own stuff and everything else that extends that. And uh, uh, sorry, this isn't going to turn into a full-on review. It'll take me ages to you know, look at all the different stuff on this. And likewise, that coprocessor on there, for example, I'm not sure how you end up uh, programming that, but I'm sure it's all in here somewhere if you check it out, I'm sure. Anyway, it's very comprehensive. They've actually put a lot of effort into this and it seems very comprehensive. So it's just a bit pricey, unfortunately. It's like a hundred and... The one we've got here is the, dev, uh, I think it's the developer kit, 199 US bucks. So it's not particularly cheap, but it does seem very comprehensive. If you just want the basic board with the 8 gig eMMC memory, 129 Yankee bucks. Anyway, it does seem very cool, and you can get in early. One of the first order, one of the first 100 developer kits now. So it seems quite comprehensive. The only thing missing, I think, is integrated uh, power over Ethernet actually embedded on the board. Because uh, that, but if you don't need it, then as I said, it just wastes board space and everything else. But uh, with the wide range DC power input and stuff like that, and I think it's missing micro SD card too. Um, because if it had a micro SD card, I would have just avoided all that hassle I had. That probably was the fault of Windows or whatever um, driver problems or whatever uh, trying to get that eMMC thing running. Anyway, um, it looks like a very useful uh, industrial Raspberry Pi compute module type thing to add lots more bells and whistles like if you're doing dual camera support and doing all sorts of other things with that coprocessor as well that's really good for like low power stuff you can just have it like background running in the uh, that low power applications processor just running in the background handling like just a couple of inputs and doing stuff like that and then it could maybe wake up and power up the main uh, Raspberry Pi compute module um, to do the more heavy duty grunty stuff. So it could be very, very flexible, this thing. It's pretty groovy. So check it out, links down below. Thank you very much, Tom Ballard from uh, Pittsworth in Queensland. Bloody Queenslander. They'll know what I'm talking about. Anyway, let's have a look. Oh, it's a, hi Dave, it's a tail light. 
It's a tail light. Thought this might be interesting to some. It is a tail prime mover tail light assembly which has failed intermittent problems. White wire is earth. 9 to 32 volts. Wow, 32 volts, really? They have, like, I thought they had 24 volt. Didn't know they had 32 volt. Anyway, brown is taillights left and dial. Interesting to know how and why. Seems like a hell of a replacement for three <laughs> incandescent bulbs. Why would it be, like, it's not even a lead one. Um, it, yeah, it's not even a lead one. It's just a bowl based one. Oh, no, it is lead based. Sorry, bowl. Oh, okay. Seems like hell of a replacement for three incandescent bulbs. Right, that's what Tom's talking about. Okay, yeah, there is. Oh, actually, this looks, yeah, this looks more interesting than it seems. Let's take a squiz. So here's the tail light that Tom sent in. And as you can see, it's rather, rather interesting. They've actually conformally coded. Um, a, a good lot of it, but it's really uneven. Look at the patches up here where there's no conformal coat. You can tell by the shine on that. And then the tops of the components aren't uh, conformally coated either. I mean, if you're going to do that, uh, they do this for moisture, of course. It stops that moisture like forming on the board and getting between the components and causing leakage and, you know, contaminated and then it contaminates with dirt and gunk and everything and then things start getting low impedance and they start effectively uh, shorting out and ruining your day. But, um, what, like, they've effectively got a potting box here. So why <laughs> I would have just, like, potted the whole blinking lot in one big solid potting compound, or at least a re-enterable potting compound or something, but yeah, curious. Let me get this uh, outer plastic bit off. And you can see the LEDs down there, they're interesting little uh, four terminal jobbies. Um, it's curious how they've got these uh, these lenses, like really, usually you'd have them like right on top, but you can see that they're actually domed underneath to sort of focus and then sort of uh, disperse that on the top or whatever, you know, the optical mechanism air. So I think we've got the convex on the bottom and then just flat on the top. Even though it looks concave, I don't think it actually is. So, yeah, it's just interesting how far they've got those off there. But if you look down in there, you can see how it actually magnifies that. So it makes it look like a larger individual dot. All right, so let's hook the red wire up and the white, uh, 12 volts, which is supposed to be the brake lights. So, oh, geez, that's pretty, oh, was it, hang on, whoa, look at that, it's climbing, and like a couple came on first, why is it like climbing like that, wow, that's, that's weird, like you would think that it would just like come on, yeah, I think that's one sick puppy, oh, it's still climbing, this is nuts. Is it just going to eventually like burn out or something? <laughs> or is that normal? I don't like, does that like, no, because brake lights aren't, they're, they're either on or off. Really? So I'm not sure what the deal is there. That's very strange. Oh, there we go. There we go. Have we, have we stopped? No, no, no. It's climbing. It's decided to climb again. <laughs> what? That is bizarre. No, no, we're going back down. We're going down. Is the magic smoke escaping from something? <laughs> Can't smell anything. <laughs> and they're just going to switch off. I, you watch, will we get like those two that just had like the threshold that we saw before? This, I, what? Here we go. They're going dim, dim, yep. Yeah, some are brighter than others. Whoa, way, look at that. Whoa, <laughs> we're pulsing. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's one sick puppy. So let's try the brown wire. That lights up the lead, red ones too, at near half an amp. It seems fairly consistent. Let's try the green. Maybe that should light up. Yeah, lights up the other side. Got our yellow. Um... And, well, okay, try both. There we go, we've got an amp total. And there's the back, we've just got some uh, surface mount resistors on there. They're all just wave soldered on. No whackers, let's have a closer look at the circuitry, but uh, there's nothing intelligent going on here. None of this microcontroller rubbish. 
Okay, what we've got here is a uh, 34063, absolutely classic. I've done a very early video on that. That's a um, just a switching uh, controller. And there's the coil down there for that and the uh, driver transistor as well. So they're used doing that uh, externally. And we've got the two uh, driver trannies over here, one for uh, this side and one for the other side. That'd just be uh, doing the constant current thing. And triple five timer for the win. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know what that's doing. Maybe some sort of blinking capability, but I thought um, these taillights like use external uh, bimetallic blinkers. That's what I thought. Anyway, I don't know anything about car or truck electrics or whatever. Um, so yeah, I, I really don't know. It looks a bit how you doing around here. Has someone had a hack at this? I don't know. Looks pretty ugly. But uh, yeah, there's not much to it. It's just going to have a constant couple of constant current drives there. So why it's going funny, I don't know. And in a mailbag, I'm not going to go in and uh, troubleshoot this. But that's that's interesting. I like how the uh, you know look they've used the big bulbous uh, lens on the top there, which then mates up with another convex lens on the bottom of that, and then a flat thing on top. I don't think the optics are quite. Uh, fascinating on that anyway not sure what these are doing do they like little they point inwards to some lens mechanism on the other sort of lens mechanism on the top they just seem to light up as part of this i think they're all the same array aren't they so i don't know not sure what the deal is anyway that's interesting thanks tom and tom did question uh, the reliability um of something like this but it seems to be quite a rugged uh, design and construction, don't mind it at all. But as I said, I would have uh, completely potted that whole thing, not just <laughs> not just uh, pour some uh, conformal coating over the top. That's that's pretty piss poor effort there. And soldering leaves a bit to be desired, considering that this whole thing is supposed to be wave soldered. You can see all these are wave soldered over here. And yeah, someone's had someone's had a hack. I reckon someone's had a hack at this. Don't get postman cards much these days, delivering memories with that circuit. <laughs> What's that going to do? Anyway, it's from the Chaos Computer Camp, Chaos Post. Awesome. So um, it doesn't actually say who it's from. It just says from the Chaos Computer Camp. I'd love to go. I was invited once, but unfortunately it's like on just after Christmas time. And for those who don't realize, like it's like in Germany somewhere and it takes like 24 hours just in flight time more like by the time you get transfers like 30 hours then by the time you get to and from the airports and to and from the destination and and your layovers and and waiting at the airport a couple of hours before it's like 60 plus hours just in travel time to get to this and back so yeah 60 hours that's like <laughs> one and a half working weeks Thank you very much, Matthew Liberty. No, you don't salute Liberty, do you? In the, in the United States of America. Thank you very much. I actually know what this one is, and it is a Kickstarter. And I guess kind of disclaimer, I suppose, is that I'm actually designing not an identical product, but pretty close to it. So, yeah, um, just a disclaimer there. <laughs> I don't know why, but I guess, I don't know, um, some people might think I'm prejudiced or something because I'm going to, d don't ask when mine is going to be available, just don't, okay? It's, <laughs> I, I don't know, so don't even ask. Anyway, it's a Kickstarter. Thank you very much. It is the Dual Scope. Yes, it's a microcurrent-like thing, but a more advanced microcurrent, like a USB one, that can do, oh, doesn't that look nice? Oh, hang on. No, they don't screw it, no, it's just uh, banana plugs, but it comes with different adapters. Anyway, dual scope, it's a um, USB microcurrent type data logger type thing. It's got a, from memory, it's got a couple of hundred kilohertz bandwidth, and um, yeah, it allows you auto ranging, and allows you to, um, yep, there's the different adapter -y things and stuff like that. Anyway, um, yes, so I am working on a very similar thing. <laughs> but anyway, let's take a look at it. It looks cool. Even got a Stanley Torx driver to go with it. Oh, beautiful. So we can open it up and uh, replace the front panel. Cool. 
Is that a PC? Is that a PCB front panel? I'm not sure. We'll find out. So here is the dual scope by Jet Perch. Uh, it's the JS110 Precision DC Energy Analyzer dual scope.com. As I said, it is a current Kickstarter which has raised, um, I think, about 115,000 Australian dollars of its 98,000 Australian dollar goal, something like that. I'm just working in Aussie Buck, sorry, that's what Kickstarter tells me. And it's a basically a USB interface um, energy analyzer, so it measures uh, current and voltage. Of course, you just feed in uh, your power supply to your device under test, your product, and out, and it measures the voltage and current and can hence uh, calculate power and basically samples that with up to. Um, it's got a 14-bit, uh, 2 meg sample per second uh, isolated, because it's got to be isolated. You can't um, and be connecting to your uh, power into your USB ground over here. That'll ruin your day. Um, it uses the same Max 4239 op amp that uh, I use in the microcurrent, of course. But yeah, it still it has that noise spike around 11 kilohertz. It actually varies quite a lot, because it's actually a uh, chopper amplifier, so it's got a chop at a particular frequency. Anyway, um, yeah, bandwidth is a couple of hundred kilohertz hertz i believe um for the two meg sample uh sample rate and this is a beta unit um it's currently going for 500 yankee bucks on uh kickstarter which is quite expensive for basically an adc in a box but it's the adc's like a two meg sample per second 14 bit converter is probably like a you know a 30 40 dollar chip on its own um you know real expensive precision parts no doubt used in this just like um even the microcurrent as simple as it is um it, like i've got resistors in the microcurrent that are like two dollars fifty us for one resistor one shunt resistor <laughs> like and that's in volume so yeah anyway um it's going to have a retail price of 7.99 yankee bucks which is Ooh, you know, it's getting up there, but that's not hugely expensive for a commercial product, which this is obviously intended to uh, be. And um, yeah, they start at $3.99, but they're actually uh, sold out. So it's currently uh, $4.99 on Kickstarter. Seven days left if you want to get in on it. Let's check it out. Now, the issue with trying to measure product current consumption, let's say you have your little uh, doodad new Internet of Things wankery gadget, and you want to measure its current consumption, well, it likely has a sleep mode, which is, you know, down in the microamps or even lower, and then it, you know, wakes up um, periodically or uh, some event or whatever, or it has, like, and, and it might not only wake up and then draw milliamps, but then it might have a, a Wi-Fi thing, which can then draw hundreds of milliamps or even amps. Um, so it, the problem with the microcurrent and any measurement device is one of uh, dynamic range which means that uh, yeah like you can't have just a single shunt resistor and then measure even microamps in the presence of amps and get any sort of resolution down at that microamp range. You need like a 32-bit ADC which is just not possible you know it's ridiculous so you've got to have range in and uh, this one does auto range in which as my new uh, version of my uh, eventually my new product I'm working on is going to have uh, the same auto ranging but auto ranging is not magic because the if the processor is in sleep mode for example you're going to get resolution let's say it you know draws a microamp or something oh we're going to open oh we've got mylar on the side we're being mooned there we go oh look at that isn't that nice ah oh. There's the, um, there's the isolation. That's pretty neat, isn't it? I like that. So I'll just leave it there while I discuss this for a minute. So if your product's consuming a microamp and you want to measure that, you know, reasonably accurately, you want to, like, a, you know, a de couple of decimal places on that probably, like, you, you know, what, three and a half digit meter resolution or whatever on that, then, uh, right, you've got to have a shunt resistor, like a 1K shunt resistor, for example, a 100 ohm shunt resistor, that then when you, you know, use some, like, times 10 or maybe even times 100 uh, amplification, you can get decent resolution on that one microamps. But the problem is, let's say your shunt resistor is 1K, then when your microcontroller just suddenly wakes up from its sleep mode and, and wants to draw a couple of hundred milliamps, wah, 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 100 milliamps through a 1K resistor, shunt resistor, to measure the uh, current, that's 100 volts. 
Uh, your power supply is only 3.3 volts. It doesn't have 100 volts to drop, so the voltage on your product drops to zero. Even if you use a 100 ohm resistor, not good enough. It's still going to drop 10 volts at that 100 milliamps. You know, a 1 ohm resistor is still going to drop 100 millivolts, 0.1. That may not make your product drop out, but then you can't get the resolution down at the lower currents. So you've got to use, uh, well, you, well, you don't have to. Um, oh, there we go. Look at that. That's very neat. There we go. We've got a header on there. It's the 0.1 inch header. That works where uh, we considered this one for the new uh, micro supply, actually. Um, and I'm just sure maybe I've done a video on it. Not sure. Anyway, this sort of um, uh, pin solution to go to a front panel. It's exactly what we're going to do on the new micro supply, but we actually went away from that in the end uh, for various reasons. But uh, there you go. That's a neat solution. I like that. And uh, I haven't seen these before. Look, they've got two millimeter, they're four millimeter uh, banana jacks with like a shrouded, high voltage shrouded ones with a two millimeter soldered pin on the back. That's really interesting. I, I don't think I've come across those. I rather like those, except that they're not binding posts, which is really annoying. I'd love to see binding posts on this product and why you need the four millimeter insulated uh, plugs on that, I, I don't know. Much would have preferred binding posts, but hey, the good thing is, is that we can change the board and we do actually have different boards. Like this one, for example, we can just plug it in and bingo, you can measure your USB power consumption. Isn't that neat? No worries. Anyway, back to the uh, auto-ranging thing. Auto-ranging is a problem because A, your circuit has to detect that current and then switch fast enough before your product under test actually um, has time enough to drop out, before that voltage becomes an issue and starves your product of current. And if you don't have enough bypass capacitance either on the output of this, which you shouldn't really have, or on your, or on your product um, under test that you're trying to measure, uh, then it can drop out pretty quickly, like it can drop out in microseconds, you know, hundreds of nanoseconds, something like that. If you don't have enough bypass capacitance and it suddenly goes from drawing a microamp up to an amp, wah, that can ruin your day. So ultimately there's no magic solution for this. You just try and switch auto range uh, your shunt resistors as fast as possible, but ultimately there will be some products where that simply is not a solution. So unfortunately you've got to do like manual, you know, you really have to do it manually by setting a manual range and then forcing your product into one mode then forcing it into another. You can't sort of measure it dynamically. So yeah, there's always limitations there, but apparently this can switch in, I think it's like a two microsecond. Yeah, under overflow two microseconds. There you go. Tells you and switches ranges on overflow in under two microseconds to ensure the target device runs unhindered. Un hindered and then if it is true auto ranging you've got the issue of um hysteresis and like switching back and all that sort of stuff you don't want it to like the ranging to oscillate and and things like that if there's like little dips in the dropout or whatever it's it you know it, it's quite a difficult problem to solve auto ranging so yeah i i wouldn't expect this to get it right for every product you know i guarantee you there will be products where this can have the world's best auto ranging for this sort of thing and you're still going to find products that is going to be an issue with oh geez i really need to take a high-res photo maybe i'll do it as like a take a high-res photo and then we can zoom around this baby in in software editing that might be easier all right so let's have a look at this there's our nxp processor there there you go it's upside down so all the electrons are going to fall out and uh that's doing all the usb uh streaming and uh comms and everything else then we've got something else down here. What's this ice? What is that? Oh, that's a lattice semiconductor. Um, d d d that looks like a CPLD. Anyway, it looks like we have an interface here that does some data and stuff like that. That's on the PC side of things. Now, this is interesting. One thing, which I don't know if this has, but you would probably want to add to a product like this, is a synchronization with your product under test. So a synchronization with a digital signal. This doesn't have any digital inputs. Now it's got some generic ones over here, but these are on the, not they're not on the product side. They're not on the isolated side. They're on the PC side of things. So yeah, um, so you could maybe add some functionality there, but it's on the, 
it's on the uh, wrong side of the force, unfortunately. And it looks like we've got a trace input there, programming debugger header and all that. That would be an NXP header. We've got another lattice part over here. Um, so is, there, is that one of those mini um, uh, FPGAs? The ICE 5LP2. Yep, that's one of their uh, Ice Cube Ultra Low Density FPGA design. You get more for less, blah, 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 all that sort of jazz. So the neat thing about that is it's available in a, you know, a reasonably usable package. None of that BGA rubbish, although you've got the you've already got the BGA over here. So, you know, you pay that uh, assembly penalty there. You may as well pay it everywhere else. Now, what am I, what I'm interested in here, so this is obviously doing like data formatting to go across the uh, isolation channel here. What what isolator are they got? There you go. They got the uh, Silicon Labs um, the eight six, and that's the uh, low power six channel digital isolator that does uh, 150 megabits per second. So more than good enough. Um, we're only doing uh, well. No, we're doing two meg samples per second. It's samples per second. So uh, you've got to multiply that by however many bits. In this case, 14 bits conversion. So you need a 16 bit word there. So you've got to multiply the two meg samples by 16. So it's got 32 meg bits per second across that little uh, channel there. So that's why they're doing some like formatting inside the FPGA there. They're just doing some da fast data formatting because you probably can't uh, and and some buffering as well. They're probably doing some buffering and stuff like that. And then the micro might read that at a slower rate. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, um, we've got a um, STM32 micro on the low side that would be doing uh, I assume all of the auto range, and I have no idea if you can do this uh, manual or auto range, uh, like choose manual range or not. It might just be um, all automatic all the time. Have a browse around. I, I like, and I prefer doing this on the PC now. It's just nicer than trying to do it on camera and set the angles and do everything. Take a nice high res photo, and you can just, you know. You can just pan around until the cows come home. Anyway, what I'm interested in is the shunt and uh, switching. So if we go over here, here's our input connector here. And these are obviously uh, big ass MOSFETs. Don't even need to look up the number. You can tell by the pinouts how they shorted all the pins there, shorted all the pins there. And they'll have one for the uh, gate drive. So that's a MOSFET. So I can see our shunt resistors right away. Okay, so let's have a look at what's going on here. Here's our first shunt resistor. And this looks like... I think, like, I thought that was 10 ohms, but I think that's actually 10 milliohms shunt resistor. And that's, this MOSFET here is the one that's uh, actually shut. Why you'd need to shut that off? You wouldn't need... Oh, sorry, no, it's going at the positive side. Okay, so that's enabled all the time. And then you've got the 100 milliohm, the 0.1 ohm shunt resistor here. That is not a four terminal jobby like I have on the uh, microcurrent. Neither of these are four terminal jobbies, and I don't see any uh, Kelvin connection coming off there. Um, so they've got an unpopulated, maybe they <laughs> thought they needed something, not at 100 milliohms. The capacitor's going to do uh, NAF all there. That's why they left it off. But we do have, here's a 1 ohm shunt resistor up here, and these would be all like 0.1% jobs, something like that. Um, because there's two ways to do it. You can either build in the accuracy into the resistors, or you can calibrate it later. It's six and one, half dozen the other. Depends where you want to spend your money. Do you want to spend your money calibrating the thing, or do you want to spend the money buying the good resistors so you don't have to calibrate the thing? Meh. And uh, right, so they're tapping that off, and that's going to the max up 4239 over here, or 4238. Yeah, they've got the higher bandwidth, so. The 4239, I think, is the higher bandwidth one. And then that MOSFET there shorts out the 100 milliohm. Where, yeah, it gets rid of... No, it gets rid of the top part. So they're shorting out the top parts of them. So it shorts out by the top string, I mean. So, uh, yeah, that one there, because we're still in, you know, reasonably high current territory, so we need a grunty, two grunty MOSFETs there, and then we start getting to more little pissant MOSFETs here. Surprised they don't use all the same there, actually, but they've actually used another two of one type, then another two of another type, and then we've got our other uh, shunt resistors here. So this would be one ohm, This would, they're obviously going up decade, so this would be 10 ohm, 100 ohms, and 1k shunt resistor and then they've got another maxim amp up here so it looks like um yeah they're the looks are they permanently measuring 
Looks like they're permanently measuring across the bottom shunt resistor. Anyway, I'm not going to analyze it until the cows come home. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what I expected to see, except I expected to see maybe some four terminal, more expensive four terminal shunt resistors on there, and I don't see it. Um, especially for the price. As I said, like, you know, you can pay three, four dollars for a, a single, you know, uh, good shunt resistor, four terminal shunt resistor. And they've got lots of miscellaneous uh, amps and stuff happening around here. So, not sure what the deal is there. Lots of, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go in. This is just a mailbag. Jeez, I'm not going not going to go to town. What do we got here? And, aha, uh -huh, these are your comparators over here because to do your auto ranging, you've got to have the comparators to be able to set the thresholds where you want the auto ranging to happen at. So, this is actually doing auto ranging in hardware, which I'm, I'm surprised it's not quicker than the two microseconds then in uh, hardware. But, uh, you know, I, that was one of my questions. Is it doing... Uh, this in ha is it doing auto raging hardware or software? It's there's I don't see any reason to have the comparators there um, if you weren't doing it in hardware. Anyway, this design looks pretty jazzy. Looks like it can do the business. So obviously our ADC is in here somewhere. Where is it? You know we're going to have a nice voltage reference and there's going to be where's the 14 bit ADC? Where's Wally? I reckon Wally's got to be one of these uh, TI jobbies here. <laughs> it's obviously like a serial output one. Um, two megabits per second serial output. So anyway, um, that looks uh, pretty good. And uh, Matt's gone through lots of design iterations. It's been two years working on this. Lots of design iterations. Uh, shows some uh, like prototype uh, development photos on the Kickstarter, which is really good. Uh, yeah, very professional looking board. Very professional looking campaign. I'm going to power it in, see if we can get something. Won't be an extensive review. I just want to power it up and see what the software's like. Well, that was easy. Check it out. No drivers to install. I just plugged it in, uh, downloaded the software, which is available for Linux and Mac, as well as uh, Windows, I think. And bingo, we've got the multimeter interface, and it works. There you go. It's updating. Of course, all these digits are bullshit. Um, I believe, I think the specs for this are 1.5 nanoamps resolution. So the resolution, so all of, so basically everything, every li a digit after the decimal point there is useless. So five useless digits on the nanoamps. It's just, nah, you know, <laughs> come on. Anyway, we've got uh, current voltage, uh, power, and energy over time, and we can reset our energy. It's just accumulating there, as you'd expect. <laughs> 56 picojoules, there you go. Um, why has it got an accumulate thing? It's already accumulating. Not sure there. Anyway, um, our device, wonder if it can have more than one. And we're multimeter uh, default. So let's go into oscilloscope default. And woo, woot. Look at that. Wow, that's fast update, isn't it? Can I, yeah, I can go full screen on that. Wow, that's pretty, ja hey, there we go. Yep, yeah, that's all 50 hertz pick up and crap. And it's ranged right down. So that's why you're seeing all the noise and crap like that. So let's get some uh, piezo electric effect boom 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 we can see it on the current on the top current on the top voltage on the bottom that's that that axis whoa oh yeah different response there so that's yeah has it got like triggering it doesn't seem to have triggering not that like it, I wouldn't have expected it just occurred to me because I'm doing like oscilloscope functionality I thought we could have like a software trigger and it could stop sampling that'd be nice um, anyway it's not there by the looks of it and and here we go we can actually auto uh, manual range by the looks of it yep 10 amps flat line and it, once again yeah here's where it shows you check this out this is where it shows you let's say we went to 180 milliamps right which is a reasonable range Let's look at what the, yeah, it's auto scale. Okay. So it's, um, if it went higher, it did, or it's just auto scaling the graph. It's auto scaling the uh, y axis. So it's not like it's going to 180 milliamps. It's, look, 800 microamps. There it is. So the noise is like we've got like 200 microvolts of noise down there. So imagine if your product was in sleep mode drawing, you know, if it was drawing 200 microamps, that's a ridiculously high sleep mode. You know, it might be in the order of 20 microamps, you know, like, you know, tens of microamps tops. You can't measure it in 180 
milliamp mode, right, with a 14-bit converter. You can't do it. This is why you need um, auto range in and or, you know, to manually arrange things and then force your product into different ranges and stuff like that. What else have we got? Let's have a look. Uh, what is that? Automatically. Ah, right. So we can change the auto range. Uh, there we go. We can change the... Oh. What have I done there? Why are they separating like that? What? Oh, that's the... Oh, that's our time base. Okay, I'm using the mouse, um, the scroll wheel. I'm using the scroll wheel. There you go. That's got to be, surely. No? What's... Yeah, there we go. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the X axis there. It doesn't... It's not labelled. I don't see the x-axis. Oh, I, okay, we've got our nice cursory things. I don't see the x-axis being labelled there. It's like 8.4 watt. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? I, I don't get it. What's what's going on there? 14 seconds. Yeah, that's okay. So we're now in seconds because it'll take, should take, you know, 14 seconds to get most of the way across the screen. 15 seconds there. Why does that not display it? seems silly anyway we've got voltage ranges 5 volts or 15 volts so you know if you're using a 3.3 volt thing then you'd uh, use your 5 volt range just to get extra resolution but voltage is not the thing here like it, it doesn't matter you could use an 8-bit converter for the voltage and like meh who cares or a, you know 10-bit or something like that if you want to gild the little there's no need for a like a 14-bit converter for the voltage for example so because you just you don't care. Current's what the thing you want to measure over the massive dynamic range, over like the eight different ranges that we have here. How many ranges? Two, four, six, eight, uh, seven. Well, we can turn off the current. Not sure why you'd want to turn it off, but okay. Fair enough. And it, we turn it off and it's, it's just giving us still our noise. So yeah, 18 microamp range. Hang on, I've changed ranges. I've changed ranges and we get in. I've gone down to the 18 microamp range and we still get in noise like that. I still don't know why that's coming together like that. What's 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 going on here? And of course we can just instantly stop it. Oh no! How do we start again? Record button? No. What what's a, a dual scope data uses its own data format? Can you like um, export? And stuff like that. I don't see export. I'd want to export my data to XLS. Jeez. Device. Dual scope. Currents raw. Okay, that took time to come back. Why did that come back? After all that time. Okay, we can save it, but meh. And that's what's in the dual scope uh, file format. So it's certainly not uh, XLS. Doesn't look like yeah. Doesn't look like you can save your data. And then if we stop it, we can't select data. Oh yes, 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 we can. Can we select? Oh, that's that zoom in. Okay, there we go. Not sure why it's having the different colours. That's as close as we can zoom. It won't let us zoom in any more than that. Okay, but we can't export the raw data. Hmm, that's not good. Anyway, look. Oh, look. Look, we can jump uh, jump to voltage current multi display. That's kind of cool. Current voltage, okay. And then we can have power graphs. That's that's pretty flexible. I like that. Single value display. Okay, neat. Developer. Ooh, we can get all the developer stuff. I frames, M frames, example. I just noticed it took actually a long time, like tens of seconds before I press the play button here, before it actually popped up. Anyway, um, the developer edition actually comes with comes with these little uh, little demo board. We've got a little uh, processor there and a little uh, power supply that you power from a micro USB. And this allows you just to demonstrate this. So look, we're getting 3.3 volts. So obviously, um, and it's drawing, you know, near odd 20 microamps there. So let's bugger off out of the multimeter and have a look at our current there. How, where's our, oh, sorry. We're uh, auto, let's auto, let's auto range our current, shall we? Five volt range. See, 3.3, I don't like that. It just shows you, your, <laughs> it zooms in the noise there. It's kind of silly. Um, let me see if I can get something from here because I'm not getting anything on the current, uh, amps, okay. For some reason, it's not 
Oh, there we go. Yeah, I think the software's a little bit, a little bit buggy. There's something going on there. Anyway, yeah. Um, let's. Oh, why does it? Once again, it adds those. That must be like, is that a peak function or something? What? What's going on there? I don't. I have to RTFM on that one. Wow. Okay. Yeah, the auto range is just. It's all over the shop. Um, it'd be nice to have like a trigger and then you could capture an event, but it looks like you might have to manually do it because I don't see any other ability here to do that. So that's a bit of a shame. Okay, press the Arduino reset button apparently, and it will. I'm pressing the Arduino re. Oh, yeah, it's flashing. It's flashing, but uh, I don't see any other action going on there. So there we go. Hey, there we go. There we go. This is the uh, this is the one used in their example. Yep. Okay. There we go. So at a slow time base. So we'll just yeah. There it is. So current milliamps. So this is not right. So it's auto ranging back to the microamps there. And if we push the Arduino a reset button, it's going to take some time. Is it flashing? It's not flashing yet. Here we go. One flash. No. No. Yep. There it goes. There it goes. So just, you know, it works. Um, yeah, it, it, it does the job. But, uh, like, the software, I, it's uh, maybe there's a few little quirks in it. Um, it's not as full-featured as I like. But it's open source. It's all, The software is all open source. And the, the hardware is not open source. But the software and the files for the front panels and, and stuff and, and things like that are, though. So, yeah, it can kind of do the business. So, needs some spit and polish, but this is a complicated product. There's a lot to do in the software if you really want to uh, really want to make it polished. But there you go. That's the dual scope. And it does, it, it kind of works as advertised. Once again, this is not a large dynamic range here. This is like milliamps. This is like, you know, 8, eight milliamps down to... You know, tens of micros. It's not a good example showing the massive dynamic range. This isn't a review. I was, so I won't uh, go and set up, you know, a, a demo, a better demo than this. And yeah, it's jump, no, it's, it's jumping to 600 microamps, right? So it's jumped from 600 microamps to 8 milliamps. You can just do that on one range. So these red traces here, these are actually the min-max, and yellow is the average. I'm not even sure you can actually view the raw data maybe there's a was there a raw mode option anyway um it, it's completely buggy i don't understand look the yellow live data is down there okay i've manually set the range to 18 milliamps and yet these the red traces are up at 60 plus minus 60 microamps why this is absolute insanity i'm not i don't even know why you can if you can turn that off or not and so i'm fixed range now I'm fixed range, and I can't. I don't see how you can fix the axes either, right? So we've captured our data, but look, um, the min max, oh, like stop, stop. <laughs> like look at the look at the maximum there, right? I'm on the 18 milliamp range. Noise is not going to be like I I I can't see the noise actually being like that, and if it is. Uh, that much, like, uh, say, it's from, you know, 3.4 milli uh, milliamps up to 3.8 milliamps, if your noise is actually that high, why can't we see it um, in a live view? And I, I just don't believe it. Because, like, look at all these, look at these peaks up here like this. Like, and then the it's showing the average. I don't... Uh, it's, I, I just don't like the way this thing operate the software operates that's just wrong that is wrong so and then okay okay there might be that much noise there but we can't see the live data so i'm not sure how that works right there's no option to say uh average is there device waveform grid x show me okay so we can disable our min max trace width okay so we can get rid of our min max that's better Okay, that's less confusing. And is it doing like a rolling average? Um, oh, there we go. There we get our spikes. That's better. Now the confusing min-max crap that doesn't work. And you can't... It looks like... I don't think you can scale your axes. Can you... Like, I can't... There's nothing I can do to do that. But, yeah, anyway. I 
I don't know. It's it's weird and buggy. Don't get it. But it kind of works. There you go. Like it's 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 doing what you kind of expect. But I, I don't know. Averaging. Mm, I want the real data. And check this out. There is certainly a delay in. I've got the live update current here. Okay. So it's 0.7 microamps. This little Arduino's drawing in uh, live mode. I fixed. Let's fix the current range to 18 milliamps. Okay, look, actually, let's go to 10 amps. Yeah, there we go. You can see the see the resolution change. Why, why you get all that, those digits? It's just silly. Anyway, 2 amps, like it should, yeah, it, it gets better and better. Okay, 180 milliamps, there you go. And hey, so 18 milliamp range, okay? So watch the current there and then the waveform, okay? So it jumps up. 3 milliamps, but we get nothing on the display, and then it comes in. And then it jumps up and comes in, and uh, boop, so there's, uh, like, um, yeah, it's, you're not getting your live data on your oscilloscope screen. I think that's pretty silly. This thing does actually work, and uh, it's, yeah, out of the box, and it, the hardware looks uh, quite decent, and the software needs some spit and polish, but it's open source, and you can do whatever. Um, it's missing a few features, but it's really quite expensive, especially if you uh, don't get the Kickstarter and it's seven ninety nine um, retail when it comes out. So yeah. Anyway, I'll link to it down below. Dual scope. Oh wow! Not sure if you can hear that, but it's hailing outside. There's hail.